unless a pair of us really working well together, he was going the wrong way to what I was going. Well, as you've just seen, our new pup is getting really used to the Blue Peter studio. He's not worried at all by it. And also, we've had some marvellous suggestions of names for him. And the thing that we've been very pleased about, there are all the postcards that you've sent in. You've kept the names nice and short. Because uh, by tradition, you see, sheepdogs uh, have always had nice short names so their owners can give quick commands when they're rounding up the sheep. Now, if you miss Blue Peter on Thursday, then you probably haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, so I reckon I ought to tell you. You see, our new sheepdog, our new pup here, is a Border Collie. Now, we've got to give him a name, and we've asked you to, to name him. Now, the closing day is on Thursday. Now, to send a, a, a new name for him, I'm getting mixed up here. Pup, don't go away. Don't go away. There we are. Uh, don't put it in a letter, stick it on a postcard. Put the puppy's name on that side, and on the other side, Blue Peter Puppy, BBC Television Centre, London W12 7RJ. I'll repeat that. Blue Peter Puppy, BBC Television Centre, London W12 7RJ. Ah, and I feel better for that because I got my breath back now. You had me worry at the beginning. But uh, it'll be nice, actually, on Thursday when we can choose a name of the, the most popular one that's been sent in. Yes, and you're gorgeous. Yes, you are, and you've got strong teeth. So we call him Fang, I think. And uh, instead of calling him Pop, he said, I've been calling you Pop, haven't I? Shall I call you Pop again? We'll go up and see Petra. Right? Come on, Pop. Pop, 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 pop. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, pop, 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 pop. There we are. We made it this time. We were going in the right direction for once. Right. There you are. Come on. Shovel. Shovel. Come on. There we go. Hello. He still hasn't got his collar, as you may have noticed. I think you've got one for him. Yes. No. First time on now. Now, this collar is... No, it's not to be chewed. But the great thing about this collar, even if it is, there are no rivets or staples in it. It's a stitched one. And it's rolled, so when it goes round his neck, there's not going to be any rubbing. He hasn't had one on before, has he? No. Or I don't think much of it, I don't think. It will make his neck sore. There we are, mate. All right? Doesn't seem to mind it. I don't think he knows it's there, does he? Well, one of the first jobs, of course, is to get a bed for the new puppy. And uh, the one that Johnny's got is exactly the same as the one that we made for Petro when she was a puppy. And it's probably the best idea you can possibly have for a puppy's first bed, because all it is is a cardboard box. Yes, you hang on to it, will you? Because it's very important, this is down here. It's, uh... I'm on the travel again. It's not going to have any staples in or... or pins or anything at all, anything that the puppy can chew, because if he starts to eat it, then he's in trouble. I've, I've got a box here. I'll show you how to make the bed. I've taken all the, the staples out of this one here. I haven't stuck the, the bottom flaps down with sticky tape, because there again, the dog can rip it off and chew it, and then he's in trouble again. All I did was to glue the flaps down there on the bottom. But well, once you've done that, that's the bottom complete. You turn it upside down, You've got four flaps here, so tear off one of the flaps. This is quite easy to do. And, of course, the size of the uh, box really depends on the size of the puppy. If you've got an Irish wolfhound, then I think you've got a few problems there with uh, making a bed out of a cardboard box. But if you've got a sort of medium-sized puppy, or even a small one, uh, then you're all right. Well, when that's off, you tuck in the the other three flaps like that and now we've got to uh, cut down the uh, corners of this box cut down to about halfway you need a strong pair of scissors for this and use scissors don't use a knife because you can do yourself an injury actually with a knife uh, I think you can do yourself an injury with scissors oh, it's killing me thumb well, we'll soon be through. About halfway down there, and when that's done, like that, you just bend over the flap, and there you are. You've got the bed being formed already. Just put a nice crease along there, and you'll notice that there, where it folds over, that holds down the, the flap, and it, it does so at the other side. Then inside, put some newspapers, just in case the he wets the box at night. The newspapers will then soak up all the water. It won't get through onto the cardboard. We put quite a, a number of papers in here, and that will save the box. Then, after the newspapers, 
a nice blanket, nice soft, cuddly one folded up. And in fact, the pup's already. Hey, hey, hello, you found it. There it is, all nice, snug as a rug, aren't you? Hey, is that nice? I, ooh, I clever. <laughs> yes, well, now that the pup is snug, uh, what you've got to do is to make sure that you don't put him near any drafts, because he's quite tiny at the moment, and if he gets uh, too near a draft, then he's liable to catch a cold. And this bed, in fact, should last the puppy until he's nearly fully grown. After that, well, you can either get a bigger box or you can uh, buy one of those ready-made ones. And now for more news of Blue Peter Flies North, over to Val. If you were watching Blue Peter last week, you'll have known that John, Pete and I had a fantastic time exploring Iceland. We saw things like the Great Geyser, we saw gigantic waterfalls, bubbling mud and hot springs, as well as spotting seals and being attacked by ferocious great skewer birds. But after that, the three of us decided that we'd like to split up. John and Peter wanted to go even further north to the Arctic. But I decided I'd like to fly north in Britain instead. I thought I'd like to find out more about some of my favorite characters in history. It's always interesting to see where they lived and try and imagine the things they did and what sort of feelings they had. And my first investigation was in the West Riding of Yorkshire. The West Riding is very hilly with towns and villages that cling to the side of steep valleys. One of the most isolated is the village of Haworth on the edge of the moors, but its name is known throughout the world because 150 years ago, a very famous family came to live here. The horses pulling the covered carts with all the family's furniture had a hard struggle up these steep, cobbled streets. So the oldest of the children, and there were six of them, all under seven years old, jumped off and ran along beside their father. Eagerly, they looked from side to side at the dark stone houses, at the Black Bull public house at the top of the hill, and also at the little village shops. But it was the church that their father, Mr. Bronte, was looking for, for he'd come to be the new vicar of Howarth. As the family rounded the corner by the church, Mrs. Bronte caught her first glimpse of the square stone parsonage that was going to be her family's home for the rest of their lives. There weren't any trees then, they were planted later by the Brontes, but the house is exactly as the family first found it 150 years ago. The children hurried in to explore. They ran across the sandstone flags and scrambled up to the top of the stairs. They took no notice of the big bedrooms to left and right, but rushed straight into a small spare room. They put in tiny furniture and called it the children's study. They looked outside at their new garden and were sure they would be very happy. But their mother was frail and ill, and before they had been long at Haworth, she died. The parsonage became quiet and sad. An aunt came to look after the younger children, Charlotte, Emily, Anne, and Branwell, the only boy. But Mr. Bronte took the eldest girls, Maria and Elizabeth, away to boarding school. Maria and Elizabeth were very keen to learn, but they found the school cold and unfriendly after the quiet warmth of their home at Haworth. The food was dreadful and the school uniform thin. And when Charlotte and Emily joined the school some months later, they were shocked to see the teachers were unkind to their elder sisters. Then Maria and Elizabeth fell ill. Mr. Bronte came immediately and was very angry. He took Maria and Elizabeth away from the school to care for them at home, but he was too late. Charlotte and Emily were told that Maria, who was 12, and Elizabeth, who was 11, had both died. They never forgot this awful moment as long as they lived, and the unhappiness they had seen at school always haunted them. They returned to Haworth and took up their quiet lives again with Branwell and Anne. The girl's aunt taught them to look after the house, and whilst Branwell practiced drawing and painting, hoping to be a great artist one day, his sisters learned to make things for themselves. This was some of their needlework. It was called a sampler because you had to put into it a sample of every different stitch that you knew. Every well brought up girl was taught to sew like this, and usually they were so proud of their work, they put their names in as well. This one was done by Anne Bronte, the youngest of the sisters, and she's also put finished this sampler November 28, 1828. But the Bronte sisters soon got fed up with just sewing, and strangely enough, one of their favourite pastimes was playing with toy soldiers. One day, Mr. Bronte had been on a journey to Leeds, and he came back with a box full of wooden soldiers, like this one which he brought as a present for Branwell. But the girls loved them just as much as Branwell did. They used to call them the young men. They almost came to believe that they were real people, and they took them with them everywhere they went. 
Behind the parsonage stretched the moors of the Pennine Hills, mile after mile of heather and gorse. The Bronte children knew every inch of them, but their favourite spot was a little valley about a mile from Howarth, where the tumbling moorland stream was crossed by a small stone footbridge. It was here they came to play, and it was here that they brought their toy soldiers. They stood them up here on the stones, and they told each other stories about them, bringing in all the books that they'd ever read and many famous characters from history. Charlotte called one of her soldiers the Duke of Wellington, and Branwell named yet another Bonaparte. Often they set their stories in the countryside that they knew, and the wild, desolate moors, the isolated farms and the bleak weather all became part of their make-believe game. Soon the stories about the young men became longer and longer, and the Bronte children wanted to write them down. So they did, in tiny little books like this. This one is actually for one of the toy soldiers called Sergeant Tree. And they made these books themselves, stitching old pieces of paper together, and wrote in the smallest possible writing, small enough for a toy soldier to read. Above all, they never told anyone about their stories, not about their books or the soldiers or the moors or the valleys. It was all part of the young Bronte's secret world. But the children were growing up. This portrait was painted by Branwell when his sisters were teenagers. Their make-believe games had to come to an end, and all four went out into the real world to earn their living. But leaving Haworth was as disastrous as it had been before. Branwell never became a famous artist, as they'd all hoped. For a while, he took a job as a clerk on the new railways, but he was dismissed in disgrace. Gentle Anne was sad and lonely as the governess to a family of spoiled children. Charlotte was ambitious. She wanted the girls to start a school of their own, and she went with Emily to Belgium to get some training. But Emily nearly died of homesickness. She longed for the wide open slopes of the moors and the quiet, happy life of Haworth. So, one by one, the Brontes returned home. They withdrew from the outside world, and at Haworth, they began to write again. Every evening at nine o'clock, their father retired to bed, only stopping to wind the clock. The three girls stayed in the parlor, and today it's still possible to imagine how they would write and talk. Charlotte sat here with Emily and Anne beside her. They wrote poems and stories just as they'd done when they were children. But now, Charlotte persuaded them to write to London to try and find someone to publish their work. In the letters they wrote to London, they used men's names because all those years ago, it was almost unheard of for girls to write books. And they thought that their work might not stand much chance if they used their own names. But they decided to keep their own initials. So Charlotte Bronte became Curra Bell, Emily became Ellis Bell, and Anne became Acton Bell. After months of anxious waiting, at last a letter arrived to say that the books had been accepted and were going to be printed. This is Anne Bronte's book, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. And then there's Emily's stormy, wild book, Wuthering Heights. And Jane Eyre by Carabelle. Charlotte's first book. So it did look as if at last fame and success had come to the Bronte sisters. But not to Branwell. He went night after night down the dark alley beside the church and in the Black Bull he drank and talked the evenings away. He knew he had failed as an artist. He made himself ill and he died. Charlotte was heartbroken, not only by his death but by the ruin that he had made of his life. Worst tragedy was to follow. At Branwell's funeral, Emily fell ill, and within three months, she too was dead. Little Anne shared Emily's room during her illness, no one realizing the danger of infection, and she too died just five months later. Charlotte was utterly alone. She had no brother to talk to, no sisters to walk with her on the lonely moors, no one to whom she could read her stories. Charlotte wrote down her thoughts at this time in a letter to a friend. When I go out on the moors alone, everything reminds me of the times when others were with me. And then they seem a wilderness, featureless, solitary and saddening. My sister Emily had a particular love of them. And there's not a knoll of heather, not a branch of fern, not a young bilberry leaf, not a fluttering lark or linnet, but reminds me of her. 
The distant prospects were Anne's delight, and when I look around, she is in the blue tints, the pale mists, the waves and shadows of the horizon. The loneliness that surrounded Charlotte was terrifying, but she conquered it. She found strength in the memory of her brother and sisters and began writing again. She completed two more books before her death, and through her, the public came to know better the works of Emily and Anne. So today, Howarth is world famous, and thousands of visitors come to see the Moreland village that produced not just one, but three of England's greatest writers. So, but whilst Val was up there on the Yorkshire Moors, John and I were meeting some extraordinary people, and they lived in the land of the midnight sun. You can see how we got on with them on Thursday. But to visit all these places on Blue Peter Flies North, Val, John and I, quite naturally enough, went by aeroplane. And the British Airports Authority have just announced that over 20 million passengers were carried last year. So air travel is obviously very much taken for granted nowadays. But at the beginning of the century, aeroplanes had just been invented and every flight was quite an adventure. In 1909, for instance, the English Channel was flown for the first time by a Frenchman called Louis Blériot. And we've got some actual film taken at the time. It's a bit scratched now, which uh, isn't surprising as it's so old, and it was made before the days of sound. The record attempt started in a field near Calais, and the first pictures show Blériot in the cockpit getting ready to start the engine. Spinning the propeller was the starting method they used on these old planes. They must have run out of film at the vital moment because there aren't any pictures of the takeoff. But here's the plane setting out over the channel on its way to Dover. The crossing was successful only because it rained. The engine was overheating and the rain cooled it down. Back in France, he received a hero's welcome. Everyone wanted to see this brave man who'd flown all the way from France to England. And here in the Blue Peter studio today, we've actually got a real Blerio monoplane. He built this one in 1910, one year after that historic flight, and it's, it's absolutely identical to the plane that he used then. 61 years old, and it's in perfect flying condition. And apart from one other machine, this is the only plane in the world with all its original parts that can still fly. What's it like in the cockpit, Johnny? Oh, it feels a little bit unprotected. And I reckon Blerio must have been a very brave man indeed to just sit here open to the elements, never quite sure whether it was just going to fall apart or not. Well, it feels a bit flimsy, it isn't really surprising, because the Blerio Type 11 was made mainly from wood, it's mostly pine and ash, and the wing surfaces and the tail, they're covered in a very thin linen. And this is covered with a coating of dope, which is a, a kind of varnish, the same sort of stuff you'd use on a model aeroplane, and it makes the linen very taut and almost transparent, but it's quite easy just to put a finger through, so I'd better be careful with that. Everything about the plane was designed to keep it light, even the undercarriage, the wheels here, are ordinary sort of bicycle type wheels, you can see how small they are with my hand in there, and instead of the complicated hydraulic system that uh, they have on modern aeroplanes to cushion the shock of landing, this one just has some thick bunches of strong elastic. If I bounce the plane up and down a bit, you can see how they Good. take the strain there. Nice ride there, John. <laughs> and uh, if the landing's particularly heavy, there's a wooden collar just there, and that stops the whole suspension there going up and smashing the rest of the plane. It's not going to fall over now, is it? No. Well, there's a seven-foot prop there at the front, which is perhaps one of the strongest pieces on the aeroplane. It's made out of laminated wood to give it the strength, and by today's uh, standards, it's a little old-fashioned, but there again, it was driven by an old-fashioned engine. The engine behind it is a, a three-cylinder, 25-horsepower Anzani engine. Uh, there was a slight problem in the early days, as Pete said, uh, although it was, it was efficient, it uh, overheated. And Blerio, to overcome this problem, actually cut holes in the cylinder wall there that Pete's pointing to. Actually, if you turn the prop round, you'll, you can see that piston inside moving up and down. There it is, there going are. through. And when the prop goes right over, you can hear the you sort of hiss it? as it comes up onto compression. There it goes. That's it. Almost That's started, isn't it? Lovely. Well, in front of the pilot here is the fuel tank. This held four gallons of petrol. It would uh, take the pilot so oh, flying for about 30, 40 to... 50 miles. It was only small because in those days for flying weight was very vital. But the interesting thing actually is there was only one instrument in this aircraft and that was it. It was an oil pressure gauge. There was no altimeter to tell you how high you were, no compass to say which direction you were flying. In fact, Blerio, when he flew off across the channel to the White Cliffs of Dover, he just took off and headed roughly towards it. And I think more by luck than judgment, 37 minutes later, he landed on the White Cliffs of Dover. And the landing site is actually marked 
by a stone silhouette of the plane. Well, you know, thinking back, I reckon those pilots must have been very brave indeed because there was no flying school to, to learn how to fly. You literally got in the plane, started the engine, you took off, and you either flew or you didn't. But the way they flew, the, the controls that they use are very much the same as they are today, like the rudder behind me there. That is worked from a, a rudder bar using the feet. And the elevator, is, you use a joystick. Well, this isn't so much a joystick as a Blerio Bell, as it was called. But the sideways movement of this joystick is perhaps the most interesting because instead of turning, uh, moving ailerons or flaps, it actually twists the wing. And there you can see it. The wires underneath are those uh, that are, are actually moving that wing. Now, this is called wing warping. And it's exactly the same method that was used by the Wright brothers when they made the very first aeroplane flight ever about seven years before this one was built. Well, today, Commander Goldsmith owns this aircraft. And, in fact, several... Uh, years ago, he restored it to actual flying condition. But fairly soon, it's going to have a new owner because straight after Blue Peter tonight, it's going off to the fine art, ex uh, fine art auctioneers at Christie's, where it'll be auctioned off in about a fortnight's time. But until then, it'll be on display there. It really is beautiful, isn't it's it? It's magical. It's interesting to see just how much it fetches. And I don't think Blerio could really have imagined just how much planes were going to change in such a few years. But we've got something else in the studio today that's hardly changed at all since prehistoric times. It's an animal that looks very much today as it did the times when pterodactyls and dinosaurs were wandering around the earth. And the hedgehog, and I think I've just lost one down here. I'm going to have to use some gloves to pick him up. Come on. The hedgehog hasn't changed for mill out for millions of years, there you go, come on, for millions of years because of the prickles on the back. So they haven't needed to adapt or change themselves in order to survive. Well, these four here are only about 11 weeks old, and already their prickles are really quite sharp, although when they were born, they were just very soft, whitish spines. They were discovered when they were about 12 days old under a garden shed, and obviously they'd been abandoned by their mother. Perhaps she'd been run over by a car or something. And they were discovered, I've got some milk here actually, if I can attract them to the centre here, into their little dish, you might see a bit more of them. The Narge family of Kew Green rescued them, and they were very nearly dead when they were found, and they had to feed them every four hours, come and have some milk, night and day, on very warm milk and bread. That's lovely, isn't it? They like that. Well, Mrs. Narge says that now, apparently, they are getting a bit bigger. The jolly sharp prickles have got. They eat things like minced meat, there you go. Minced meat and shredded lettuce, apple skins and things like that. But apparently at night they like to go off hunting in the garden on their own and they find things like slugs and worms and beetles. They're about 15 centimetres long and very pretty little creatures indeed. You can see their fairly long noses there. If I just lift one of them up, you can see this long nose is very useful indeed for snuffling around amongst leaves. Quite soft bodies, they're quite tame so I can pick them up and fairly long legs, which they can use to run fairly fast, and they can even swim. And I think the Nash family have been very successful indeed in bringing them up like this. I think oh, they're terrific. Have a look. Funny hedgehog there. <coughs> well, well, not interested in them. Little pup there hasn't yeah. seen a hedgehog. Hope he doesn't prick his nose. There you are. Mm -hmm. What are those, then? He yeah, doesn't yeah. know, does he? Well, well, we'll be back again on Thursday. Mind your nose. On Thursday, and by then, uh, we should know what is the most popular name that you sent in for the pup, so ah. we'll be able to christen him. We're also going to have a new competition as well. You can see John and my adventures in the Arctic. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs>